which been organized around the opening of the National Museum of Qatar. Um, I'd like to thank our hosts for inviting us. Um, my name is Mark Rappolt. I'm the editor of Art Review, which is a magazine that was founded in 1949 in London, and Art Review Asia, which is a different magazine with different ideas, which I founded in 2013 and is based in Shanghai and Singapore. The subject today is Museums of Modern Art, Current Trends East and West. And I think perhaps during the course of the discussion, we might discover how relative ideas of East and West uh, truly are. But um, I'd like to introduce this incredibly distinguished panel, first of all. Um, Michael Govan, who's in the middle, is the director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. He's been there since 2006, during which time its collection, its buildings have expanded massively and continue to expand and cover around 6,000 years, I think, from the oldest. Modern to modern. Yeah, <laughs> that modern era. Next to him is Adam Weinberg, who's the Alice Pratt Brown Director of the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. Um, recently moved into a new building designed by Renzo Piano in the Meatpacking District. And he's been there um, since 2003. And next to me is Monica Narula, who is one third of the RACS Media Collective, which is based in New Delhi, and whose exhibition I highly recommend you see if you haven't already, which is in Mataf here. Um, it's very difficult to describe what you do because it's so many things. Um, there are some things that would be conventional artworks, research projects, films, and also involved in Sarai, which is a kind of research project in New Delhi. And aside from that, curated Manifesto 7 in Botsen, um, the Shanghai Biennial in 2016, and about to do the Yokohama Triennial next year. It's a curator, artist, filmmaker, educator, everything. On the far side is Abdella Karum, who's director of uh, this institution, MATAF, the Arab Museum of Modern Art, which was founded in 2010 and is probably the largest resource of specialist, uh, specialist collection of Arab art anywhere in the world. And I have to say that I've learned a lot from various visits here um, as well. And next to him is Vasily Sorelli, who's executive director of the Moscow Museum of Modern Art, uh, where he's been since 2002. Um, which is a sort of series of buildings and education programs and a collection of both modern art and a particular focus on the Russian avant-garde as well. Contemporary. <laughs> um, so I thought maybe as a way of you all introducing yourself in your own words, um, we'd start with, um, I looked up the definition of a museum um, before this, and it seems it hasn't changed since the 17th century. Um, and it's described in the Oxford English Dictionary, um, a colonialist institution, um, as a building in which objects of historical, scientific, artistic, or cultural interest are stored and exhibited. And I was thinking at the time that absolutely describes my grandfather's house in Colombo, Sri Lanka, um, <laughs> so vague is it, um, that it might be a good opportunity for each of you, in relation to your institutions or to the use of museums, um, to describe what you think a museum of modern art is, can be, and should be, briefly. Abdella, you looked at me, so you can start. <laughs> <laughs> Mic work, working, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'm very happy to welcome you here in uh, this museum, and uh, uh, thanks, Mark, for welcoming us in this panel. <laughs> um, I think what we are doing in Metaf, what we try to do, we don't think um, on a, a museum as, as the building, as a, um, a structured infrastructure, but we think in, a, in it in a, a way as a tool, as how can we show expression of our time, that, uh, what, what we see with the Rax Media Collective, for example. This is, this is one thing. Uh, the second thing is how do we look at histories of art in this geography that we look at, how do we tell these histories? How do we document? How do we collect? How do we um, deal with the complexity of these histories? How do we deal with what we call modernities, multiple modernities? Um, so th th this is not a building. This is really a, a place to interrogate, to work uh, with this. The, 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 the third aspect is uh, really how to connect um, 
with the place where we are, uh, in, in, in Doha, in Qatar, in the region, in the world. And this is something that we really discuss every day with uh, uh, my curatorial team, but also the collection, the, uh, the education team, everyone around the table. We are more and more, and I think uh, projects such as um, uh, the Rax Media Collective really working with the people. If you look at our uh, exhibition, you'll see three languages, um, uh, English, Arabic, Malayalam. Uh, we try to involve everyone and bring everyone. Uh, uh, another aspect is to think about the future. So th the future, not the future of the museum in terms of conservation, how do we keep this for future generation? No, but how do we think we are going to contribute to what the world is going to be? So uh, I think in, in my everyday work with, the, with, with my team here and with the artists and the critics, and the, you, you have been in certain visits, and uh, we uh, confront ourselves to, to the society where we live with its uh, uh, many possibilities, but also with its limitations. And think the museum as uh, um, not a space, but more as a place where the expressions encounter the realities of our society. So I just keep it you know, like this. Vasily? Well, all, all, uh, thank you very much for being here, uh, for inviting. Um, five years ago, I was here in 2014, and again, seeing all the beauty that uh, has evolved. Well, for us, museum, uh, it's a young institution, uh, only 20 years uh, old this, uh, this year. And uh, for us, it's uh, part of it, preserving the collection and building it, and especially focusing on uh, new ideas, uh, new, new works in the collection. Um, we, don't, uh, we try to uh, as much shorten the gap between the time that the works come into the collection, organize Biennial of Young Art and other programs to help young artists create their works, commission the works, and try to buy those works in a collection and apart from that have uh, cur curators uh, study those works and educate the public because uh, in Russia it's a specific um, gap between people understanding uh, contemporary art so what we're trying to do is bringing artists and other uh, scholars to explaining it through philosophy through um, art programs and uh, we just opened an educational center so the museum becomes as a center for educational and educating what we collect and also try to uh, generate new works being done so museum becomes like a center for education or collecting so that's the way we look at it Michael uh, well we are a museum in Los Angeles of art of many thousands of years and so we're not really a modern museum, but maybe the question is relevant in the sense that one of the programs for our museum of all art history has a little bit been to reverse the timeline, since you can imagine going back in time and marching through the beginning of art towards the present, which is a sort of simple narrative. But that's all flexible, and I think one of the things we've tried to do in modern day Los Angeles is maybe flip the timeline around because in fact it's easier to be in your own time when I wake up every morning I wake up in my own time and it's it's a, a lot of work to reconstruct history in fact that's one of the educational premises of the museum is to try to do the work to allow you to have access to things that are from distant time um, and I guess the museum has some fundamental definition for hundreds of years about artifacts or now experiences or information being a container or a nexus and then the audience. But I would argue that they're changing constantly, that art has been around for thousands of years and that this thing, the museum, is a elastic um, frame. And I guess one of the things we're interested in is how elastic can it be? How can you challenge the frame itself? Because a, a museum, whatever it is, a Museum of Modern Art has a worldview Museum of Encyclopedic Art has a world view. Uh, I think about going into the Metropolitan Museum growing up and sort of seeing Egypt, Greece, and Rome, and Europe up the stairs, and that's a world view. But we don't live in that world. <laughs> we live in a very different world, especially looking from this point of view or from 
Asia or from Los Angeles actually looking across. So I, I think one of the exciting things is to imagine that the museum's frame is entirely elastic and a bit of a creative act in itself to think about how to connect art and people. I think Monica, your, your work actually is an example of our time. We're being an artist, an educator, a thinker, a curator. Um, it's a very exciting time, and I, I guess one of the challenging premises I'm interested in is, is this a question of locality and global, because originally, you know, a museum is a library for a locality, but we live in a very global society with access to information, and there's a beautiful tension in that, and I start thinking about, since our museum has local audience and tourists, we're already speaking to the world through the tourists. Maybe our mission is about art and people broadly, and we have to think bigger. So I think that elastic quality of the frame is what's interesting right now. Adam? Well, in our case, it's actually quite the opposite. We only have, we have fewer than 100 years, and in theory, it's about American art, so that kind of narrows it and makes it actually rather tight. And I'm, thinking about your grandfather's house in Sri Lanka and how museums used to be these kind of collections of, you know, storehouses of materials. And you think of the, the, you know, the tradition of museums as temples and as palaces, as places that elevated you, that separated you from the world, that cordoned you off from the world. And I think that museums today are very much about connection back into the world. And, it's not unlike what Michael's referring to and the idea of starting with the present. You, you have to start with where you are and that sense of being in the space and the place where you are. The, I always say art does not begin the minute you walk in the museum and it doesn't end when you walk out the door. What is the connection between the, um, the space of the museum, and I mean that metaphorically as much as literally, and, and what happens in the world? And, you know, it's, um, it was very interesting to us because when, we um, built the new Whitney Museum five years ago. People talk so much about the building. And um, I kept thinking about a phrase that was mentioned to me by the uh, granddaughter of the founder of the museum, who, um, uh, who uh, Mrs. Whitney's granddaughter. And the museum was founded by an artist. And so the idea was founded by a maker and a participant in the culture, not somebody who was looking at the culture, but somebody who was a participant to the culture. And her granddaughter said to me, the Whitney Museum isn't a building, it's an idea. And for me, it's that idea about participating in culture, participating because we always think of ourselves as an artist-centric museum. So we are often following and responding to and thinking about how artists act in the world because obviously these objects don't exist if there aren't makers. And that connection of maker to object, not being alienated from an object, separated, um, into a storehouse is where we try to go with it. Um, so I don't have an institution to uh, speak from. Lucky you. That's right. Exactly. That's the one thing I don't have. But I think, us, right? in a way, I connect to all the things that you've all been saying. But the kind of practice that we have um, and the kind of things that we do together. We think of it, um, or the museum, as an idea, but as, a, as an intersectional point, right? It's an intersection of so many different kinds of flows and people and ideas. Um, and this intersectional point, besides, of course, being one of space and time, uh, which is the institution and the sort of time framework it might have, it is also one of technologies, which is opposite, especially in these days when technology is obviously sort of the idea of, of technology, like the, even to show something 50 years old, which is not a painting, is much harder than you would think it would be. And of course, people, right? It's institutions are made by the people behind them. And it's a lot of people having made this um, <coughs> exhibition here. And just talking to you earlier also how ev every building, every building, every museum, even if it's your work, it feels like a different show because of, this, of the specificity of the people, the, the, the human beings are not fungible, imaginations are not fungible. And so each time uh, it feels like a different experience. But all these things intersect, and I want to just point out that when they intersect, it is not, it is, the image I would say is one of a thicket. It is not a straight line possible, right? Because 
I think the Augustinian straight line of history of time, we all know that's kind of broken, but even just in terms of all the connections that are happening, and I haven't even spoken about the public or the constituted public, yeah. or the one that is always being constituted each time a museum opens a, a door. Um, in this thicket, when you have so many kind of flows and you can't follow a certain line of time, then how do you think of the museum, right? So what we've been sort of thinking about recently is A, how does one create amplitude by bringing in different kinds of sources? We call them sources, like, so there's been certain kind of, obviously certain kinds of sources that because of the ways histories and narratives get written and power gets played out, obviously some sources have had um, different kind of import and affect. And, and one brings in other kinds of sources. I can give, you know, we just curated a show also at the MACBA, which is another, which is a museum um, where we actively sort of brought in 10, to, 10 sources, including a musician who, who's, who, who speaks of immeasurability when music is concerned, or a juggler who juggles with light, and so what is you imagine is only what you see in your, as an after image. But all of this to say that what we're interested in is how a museum can be a site for a deliberation on discursive justice. That's what we want to think through now. I mean, we're doing Yokohama, which is at the Yokohama Museum of Art, which is another museum, which also has its own history. It has also instituted the triennial. So, you know, there's, and then there's a whole discussion, of course, between event of the museological event and the non-museological event, and yet what they share and they don't share. But what we're really interested in is how does one um, look at the idea of immaterial justice, discursive justice. We understand material justice. We've been sort of post-colonial, um, post-everything and now in some ways. But we've, and, you know, in the sense that we understand how one can at least think of repartitioning and some of the questions that you've actually posed to us um, are about that. How does one repartition a partitioned landscape? Materially. Yeah. But there's also the immaterial aspect. How does one discursively um, reimagine, and I, uh, you know, but the past as much as the future, of course. And I think that the museum can be a site for that. And that's what we are hoping to develop as we are working in, at Yokohama. Um, well, maybe we should increase the talk to two hours now. <laughs> um, um, I mean, in reaction to the thicket, I know for sure that my, my mother doesn't go to a museum of modern art to see the thicket. She goes there to see all the weeds taken out and just the flowers. Mm. And I wonder if this is a difficult thing to communicate to a public. Mm. And I guess that also comes back to what Abdullah was saying about the different languages. So even for a museum of Arab art, it's more than just Arab art. And even with American art, it's more than just American art. And these mm. things are not stable in any kind of way, I think. And you're working a lot in China as well, or with Chinese art. Um, and I wonder to what extent these simple ideas of regions, nationalities, are kind of sustainable in any meaningful way? Mm. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you first. Okay. You're We're not always <laughs> oh, that's good. I think the starting of the can also take us everywhere, which is uh, really nice. So I think this, this idea of um, um, what you said at the beginning, focus, specialization of focus, or uh, um, development of knowledge dedicated to certain area in order to go in depth and share. Um, so Mathaf, the title Mathaf, Mathaf, Arab Museum of Modern Art. So it's not the Museum of Arab Modern Art, it's Ma Arab Museum of Modern Art. It's not, it goes from the, uh, an, a, a museum that is in a region that is Arab, that is very located, but is very, open when you read the title. And uh, in our uh, plans, we are talking about uh, North Africa, Middle East, uh, and a, a geography that goes from Turkey to Sudan and from Morocco to Iran. Now from, to, to, we are expanding to India and diaspora and every place that has cultural and historical connection with this place. That means the entire world, basically. <laughs> so this is why you could see 
work by say Guchan, but you you have also works by artists living in different cities: Tokyo, Los Angeles, uh, Stockholm, uh, uh, Finland. Uh, so, uh, but the, the cultural connections is also our next show is Ella Natsui from Ghana, cu curated by Okui, and we are all uh, our friend who um, left us a few days ago. And this idea of um, including or opening. Um, interrogating the geographies of, uh, of art, of the field. I, um, uh, first time I visited the museum was uh, really in the 90s. I was really a young curator, assistant curator, dispensing all this diversity of the American art in the old building of the Whitney, and then uh, seeing the new building before it, it, it opens. What I was seeing was not really the uh, American, the closed uh, proposal of an American. It was, uh, who, who is an American artist is, a very, is, is, is the world is making this, um, um, what you call the, 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 the American art. So at, at, at Madhav, what we see uh, today in, uh, in the two uh, major exhibitions we have, Imam Hussein, he's an Indian artist who died in Qatar. For, he produced a lot of work, and his, his work is um, uh, very strong and as much as involved in, in India with the um, uh, great engagement, historical, political, artistic, and also in uh, issues that relate to other places. And with uh, Rax Media Collective today, they are involved in, uh, of course, in a, a global context, but also addressing the, the, the idea of bringing, not only bringing audiences to the museum, but communicating and connecting and addressing issues that are, again, for, for, for the future, as uh, Shuda would say. And, um, uh, connecting you to the city and the, the, the language, uh, as we uh, maybe everyone know, the Malayalam we're using is uh, spoken by 600,000 uh, people in Doha. Uh, that is almost as, as much as Arabic, if, if not more. Adam, American art. Like, well, I love your metaphor of the thicket because I always think of a thicket as something you get lost in, entangled in and you try to find your way through. And um, I mean, first of all, I think, you know, each artwork in a way should be a thicket unto itself. And if it can be, you know, understood so quickly and easily, then it's probably not worth that much time. So, and then if you think of the thickets as culture, as Ab 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 Abdullah was referring to, I mean, I, he, you look at a country like the United States, which you know has often had such a kind of um, monolithic quality to it. It's a country where 800 languages are spoken. There are thousands of indigenous tribes that are there, um, and you know how do we look at art of the modern and postmodern and post-postmodern period? through that lens, and we sort of do the opposite in a way of Michael, I mean, because we are focused on the present, um, but, it's, but the history has to be focused almost through a magnifying glass, which then explodes it in the present moment, because we don't go back before 1900. And um, I think, I see our role is to kind of complicate things, is to create thickets, but to be able to provide perhaps some pathways mm -hmm. through, because um, there are a lot of people like your mother and my mother um, who have a hard time in those thickets. So you have to have a way to beckon them in, mm -hmm. um, and you know it's sort of, it, you know it's sort of like Peter Rabbit going down the hole. You want to be able to follow and have a sense of wanting to go through the adventure, but at the same time um, not have it reduced to some kind of fake linearity that is, um, in fact, not uh, uni uni unidirectional or bidirectional in any way, but actually is multidirectional. And I, so I think our jobs as museums is how do you make things as complicated possible and at the same time as accessible as possible? And those are absolutely contradictions, um, but maybe not if you believe that the process is about involving people and telling stories, because part of, I think, stories are ways of getting people involved in things, and partway through the story, all of a sudden, they realize where they are. Um, so I, 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 that's how I see our role in the thicket of things. I mean, Michael, you were, I think, implying in some ways, when you spoke earlier, that um, history is always written in the present, never in the past. Mm. And it's not really a stable construction. 
It gets reinterrogated, retold as narratives through different times and different geographies and different experiences. Right. And in that sense, are you always a contemporary museum, even if you're yeah. in the same I mean, I, I think that's really fundamental to understand that, that a worldview, an idea is only held in the present. And so everything is present. Um, it's so great. I mean, one of the reasons I love living in Los Angeles is it is a thicket. <laughs> there are hundreds and hundreds of non-indigenous <laughs> cultures <laughs> that mix um, hundreds of languages spoken. And as you live there, you realize, you know, there are as many points of view on the world as there, or, or on art, as there are art, art objects. I mean, literally, everyone takes the point of view from a different perspective. And you can say, well, that's confusing. Or you can say, that's fantastic. So I would like to think that's fantastic. And that, you know, to design a, a way of looking at art that, that celebrates those differences, multiple points of view. You asked about nations. You know, actually, if I had only known, we could have borrowed work from your grandfather for our Sri Lankan show, which is the first Sri Lankan show in the United States ever. But you could actually tell art history probably more precisely around cities than nations, because borders, nations are new, borders are always changing, um, and so cities become an, a nexus or a, a gathering point for ideas. That's a simple idea that, that changes most of what we think about about the categories of museums, is to think about maybe cities instead of even regions, because it's like nodes of a network. Um, but I think that idea that you can enter it at any point of view, I mean, obviously, it's, it, you're, you're courting chaos. Um, which there's a, there's a pleasure in that, but, but I think that the role of the museum is to make that experience not entirely chaotic and off-putting, but inviting. I mean, when you go through and walk through a park or nature, you don't immediately need to know the name of every tree to enjoy it. So if you can relax, I mean, part of the reason we work so hard to have outdoor space and, you know, a restaurant and a bar outside and all of that is to encourage this wandering <laughs> so that you take down the tension of needing to know everything and open up the possibility of just seeing. And, and I think that opening up, making people feel like they're, I mean, that's one of the hardest things. We learn to be specific. We learn to need a label. These are cultural things, not innate things. And so I think a lot of what I'm interested in is this undoing of, of, of a lot of those strictures that have um, forced us into you know, some kind of pure sense of knowledge and categories and things like that, which were useful when the world was entirely chaotic and in the Enlightenment when we needed some sense of order. But now that we have the sense of order, we might want to back up a few steps and engage this thicket, if we're using that metaphor today, metaphor. since you've nicely placed it there. And I think it's, it's kind of exciting um, in that sense. And we've the whole museum we're designing is to, is to be like that. I mean, literally, the museum doesn't have, the new museum we're designing has no front, no back. It's all transparent outside. It's on one floor, so that there's no hierarchy. And it's planned to be changing all the time, right? Like, that's a completely different way to think of a, a, a sense of space. Vasi, I mean, I think perhaps in reality, museums aren't necessarily that transparent or two thickets. Every thicket has a gardener mm -hmm. who decides where the wild stuff goes <laughs> and the other stuff goes. Uh, uh, how do you make decisions about what to do to engage a public? I mean, there's a decision about which artists to show, what shows to do. We are, I mean, when we opened the museum, uh, it focused 20th and 21st century, located in Moscow, we constantly try to evolve ourselves and evaluate our uh, public. But for example, right now we have a show just that opened of Komar Melamit, which are American artists that haven't had a show yet in, in Russia, or uh, this is the first ever show of their work. Uh, at the same time, we opened another show of um, Jan Tumik, uh, uh, who is a Romanian artist. And also it's, uh, show of this artist that is very well known in Europe. He's in every almost collection, Germany and other parts of the world. Also totally absent in, in the dark in Russia. So uh, for us is uh, basically the European context as well as the world. So bringing all this together. Separate is a collection, but we, look, we don't look at our museum as you know doing a permanent collection that 
for five years or so. Collection is, is collected, but the dialogue is ongoing. So we try to bring all the ideas and all this that has to do with this common uh, cultural background, which is whole world. If you go to Venice, you know, you have dialogues of all the artists all in one, in one place. So we, we view it as a one world, so we don't try to make emphasis on only Arabic artists or Georgian or uh, Azerbaijani. In a collection, we collect what used to be a Soviet bloc, but in exhibitions program, we try to show many voices and many dialogues, as well as we do a lot of traveling shows, not within uh, Europe, but within Russia itself. So only last year, we had went to Magadan, to Krasnoyarsk, to Yuzhna Sakhalinsk, where everywhere, as a small city museum, comparing to others, we try to show different aspects. For example, we did a transformation of language through contemporary art. In some other, uh, in Krasnoyarsk, we showed where it's a, one of the first actually museums of modern art that was built in Russia. It's in Krasnoyarsk, and it opened in 1988 in old Lenin building, which used to be. And it's, and it's a wonderful dialogue as well for people which are trained to think and see uh, contemporary art more advanced than other places in, in Russia. So we try to show them, again, um, a perspective of art from beginning of 20th century to today. So for us, it's educating our uh, you know, parts of Russia and bringing new generations of younger artists or younger public to the city and uh, you know, experiencing this all over again, so about new connections. Um, I wonder, in that sense, to what extent the education side of things is reactive or proactive. So do certain issues like decolonization come up because they're already in a public discourse and then you respond to it? Or does a museum of modern art have a role in generating that discourse? Um, Monica. <laughs> Since I don't have a museum, I'm the best person to answer this. Um, I think, to me, not being in an, institu in an institution, but, but entering in various moments and through different strategies, each exhibition also, even for an artist, I think it can be as much a way of approaching what practice can be and what an exhibition can be, which, is, which has to be approached, I think, each time anew, not like I'm repeating the same exhibition, which we all know. But I think the history of um, how, things are, how things become narrativized is a push and pull, right? You see, when I was thinking of your mum or my mum, I was thinking also of the idea of recognition. So when does a member of public recognize something in, an, in a museum? And that recognition is obviously not just of the artifact, but of themselves in it, right? That moment of recognition, let's look at the history of photography. In the very beginning, the, 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 the capturing of the image led to many people thinking it was a capturing of their soul which may or may not be true. I, the jury is still kind of out on that as far as I'm concerned. But I do believe that that encounter, obviously encounters with different, strat with different ways of making the world or unmaking the world, if you will, create obviously impact. And then they can have uh, responses which are not going to be immediately so I'm saying it's a, it's a double-edged thing, but the question of recognition is not just one of saying, oh, can I see another Indian lady in the show? It is also a recognition that allows um, the complexity of me. Do you know what I mean? It's not just the embodiment of me as an Indian woman, but it is also the other, constitute, other constituting bits of me, including the sort of the idea of the soul that got picked up by the photograph, that also has to find reflection in what the museum offers. Uh, and I think the question of education is, is this thing. It's, it's a little bit like the history of photography. At one day, everyone's going to take selfies. But for a while, it's going to be um, an, an open question as to how the image is going to be taken itself. Yeah. I was going to say, I think, uh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, to the question of is education proact reactive or proactive, um, I mean, we talk about uh, art is education. So there's two sides to this. You know, I always say art is education. It's a way of learning in a different way than you might in a traditional educational structure. But we have this notion that we do need information around art, which is, makes sense because even our decisions on what's good art has to do with having an agreement 
reading the same background materials, seeing the same things, shaping eyes to have an agreement, right? And those agreements change through history all the time. We can give example after example of things that were agreed upon to be great and then not agreed upon. So um, I would argue that since education is partly to engage in that question of agreement, how do you collect the information or commonality of something in his background to have a viewpoint on it, that if we're not doing the latter, if we're not proactive, then we're doing nothing. We can't just be reactive. We, we, because so many of those agreements um, involve questions of, of, of intellectual justice. They, they are, they need, if, if a museum, if anyone in our society isn't questioning those things all the time, then they really aren't doing their job. And I think there's a lot of criticism that's been hurled towards museums when they sort of codify a point of view and then they just stick with it. It's beautiful, people can agree on it, but, it, but the world keeps changing. So I think that, that proactive quality is something that's really essential as core mission, which maybe is not considered that normally. What I can add also to what Monica was saying is uh, uh, an exhibition like the, the one of Rax Media Collective we see here is um, we learn a lot in the exhibition about the techniques, the images, the way it's produced. Uh, it's, it's a learning about uh, the histories, the people involved in, in the making of the artwork, the expression of the society, the history that we also learn a lot about ourselves. Uh, when we are in the provisions for everybody or the two people, they, they are works that give you, let's say, some kind of indication, signs that make you learn uh, a number of things about yourself. And uh, the, the other uh, component in the, in the, in the uh, education, which, which I think maybe you can say a little more about, do, do we, because you are giving a workshop like in, in Matap, like three days workshop, art, artists on contours, um, talking to, your, to, to, to other artists working in the city and different people who are interested in not only understanding artworks, but discussing beyond the, the exhibition about notions that are much larger. Um, so I, I think the, 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 the education uh, component you, you talk about, uh, Mark, is, um, uh, is not necessarily something that is directional from the artist to the audience or from the museum to the audience or from the uh, departments of education, but it is within. It's something that finds itself or in, uh, is born within the encounters. Yeah. I guess particularly when you're talking about things like justice, it's a relative term. One person's justice is another one's victimization. Um, how do you, is, is the process of exploring this about building consensus and dialogue, or is it about coming up with kind of concrete answers to these questions? Well, if, for anyone who knows anything about what RACS does, what we do is we make questions. I think the business of giving answers is always provisional and it's always temporary. Any answer that is provided, even the, let's say, what is the idea of the present? We don't know how long the present even lasts, right? From 10 seconds to, I don't know, 10 years. I really don't know how to determine the present, which means that one is constantly moving between yesterday and tomorrow. Yester now is, what a, is a word that we've invented to try and even make sense of when we are. In that sense, I think the question of what is, see, when I, that's why I use the word deliberation as opposed to discussion, right? Because it's an, it's an aware process. You sit down and you say, let us talk about it at this point of time now and see where that, where that takes us. So it, one is deliberating. There is, there is, a, there is that um, awareness of the act being done, of the process of thought that is being done, and it is aware of its own awareness in that sense. And it is not just saying, Let's do something. It is saying, let's think about what we are thinking about so that we can, when the next question comes at us, when the next question of justice, when the next question of time um, and who got skewed in that rendition of time, um, or th then perhaps we can start another process, uh, another process of, de of deliberation. I don't think the answers can be um, absolute. I don't, and, I, and I agree with you, justice is not, um, it seems like it, it seems in our head that it is a universal idea, but actually it's not. It's not at all a universal idea. And sort of, we might need to start 
by deliberating on justice first, I suppose. I wonder how some of this um, translates into more practical level on displays in institutions, where to some degree you have to give fact and context. And I've certainly been to a lot of museums that go as far as to tell you what the artist thinks you should be thinking about the work and institutions that tell you what to think about the work. I wonder how you kind of give people enough but not too much to shut down a kind of open-endedness. To some degree, I think education is sort of a life raft for experience um, because it's, it's it, I mean, I agree with what Michael said. I mean, art in itself is an educational process. I mean, that that is what people are sharing. And actually, for me, what's always been interesting about art is that it was often nonverbal. It was a way of experience things in a kind of nonlinear way um, and a way of complicating things. And I think when we start to remove that complexity um, for audiences completely and make it very, and, and, and it's interesting because that's, that's also culturally specific too because in different cultures, people respond to artworks in very different ways. It's in the U.S., very typically, and I think people are very linear in the U.S., they always come in and they say, so what does it mean? As if there's a particular meaning or an answer or a one line. And I'm, I'm simplifying it, but I think that's often common, and I find in, some, in, in other cultural situations, it's less about what does it mean, but what is the experience of it? And I think education for us in an ideal world is to get people away from that um, uh, one-dimensional approach, but getting them to kind of give up what they expect, and as Michael was saying earlier too, get them to kind of relax and see life as continuous with art and art as continuous with life and not make the museum as something that's cordoning off of experience, but reconnecting people and deepening experience and making a place of reflection and deliberation, which is, I mean, coming back to your idea of justice and the, and the political sense, that is, I think, one of the danger of the, of, uh, of the situations right now is that the politicization of artists, of, of, of art museums, is both a very positive thing in many ways because it's challenging the social and cultural um, norms as we expect them to be. On the other hand, there's a lot of pressure to, um, to make things much more one-dimensional and um, to lack uh, I find poetry, reflection, I mean, it's one of the things I really enjoyed in your exhibition today. I mean, there's a lot of very intense political aspects of it, but it's very complicated and very layered, very poetic, very historical, very both disturbing but very satisfying. I mean, to me, um, I don't want to be in an art world that is actually all about what are the answers to the questions or telling us what is right and wrong. I'm not interested in that personally, and I also... I think most artists are more about raising those questions, not about what things are, but what things could be, because without that imagination, we're stuck. We're stuck, and I think actually one of the things, I mean, my three hours here in, in Doha, one of the things I'm, I'm kind of amazed about is that kind of openness, that there's a, there was nothing here, and now there's something here, and it's left to us to try to imagine it. That, to me, is the great creative act. I mean, the thing that we... Um, as museum people want to foster and encourage. That's why we exist, is to make it possible for people to do that. So. Yeah. I think one of the challenges is, 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 is we're all agreeing that, that there, there's this kind of immersion and pleasure in the unknown and the unstable, which maybe the public is, it's hard because all of our education systems are about summarizing and retaining information and being able to repeat it. And we're, we're indoctrinated into this system of knowledge, anything you say about art is necessarily a kind of translation. And we all know translations induce error. They, they, they create error. So there's an error in that translation. I, I don't, and the museum's problem in display is that you're, also, you're having to deal with so many variables. One of the most important variables is time. Because the only thing you can say you really want with an artwork is time. Because if you have time with it and immersion, you, you can take out more, put in more. Uh, there's a classic example of, um, people may know, an American artist who's in the Whitney's collection and is Robert Ryman, who makes the proverbial white painting. Everybody looks at this painting by this painter and there are many jokes. Your parents would say, that's, I could do that, that's a white painting. 
So at the museum that I was involved in previously, DIA, Beacon, the idea was to show 24 of those in three rooms with no text, no explanation. And of course you see there's no such thing as a single color. They're made of, there's such a variation of colors of cool and warm and, and a varieties of attachments and you realize no single work is the same and they all have incredible meaning formally and otherwise and that's just because you had time to indulge that. So I guess the tension is always that we live somewhere, we know something, we can know it well, we have a cultural tradition, so this is what's beautiful. Cultural traditions are beautiful because we have time, so we repeat them and we gain more and more out of each one of those and then there's depth. And then here comes the museum where we're gonna show you like 20,000 things and you don't have that background. So it's a problematic, I mean obviously we're always negotiating that because the other good side of it is you're, you're sparked by something and it takes you on a journey to some depth or, or some understanding somewhere. But um, I think that there's nothing but a, a tension in that and I, I think it's a good tension. I mean, I think one of the ways this works out increasingly today is um, in the media life of museums and digital platforms that expand beyond the buildings. There's a artwork by Liam Gillick in the MIA park that uses QR codes to provide additional information. Um, I wonder how much a museum has kind of busted out of its building in any kind of physical sense and caters as much to a digital native audience and online audience as much as it does to physical people who are standing within the space and how much you have to really think about that now. I mean, Adam, the Whitney has a, a kind of quite good digital art program. One of the paradoxes of, of, of a museum is our job in many ways is to explode the museum. Um, you know, we love these sites, we create these sites, we need these sites, um, uh, but at the same time there's a certain tension and contradiction in that and I think that, but you don't, I guess you don't know how significant they are unless you kind of move outside them and use that kind of dynamic of, you know, doing, connecting yourself with the world, but then under, you know, if, if, if museums, going back to your original question, on some level are about certain kinds of artifacts and about things that we invest with some kind of energy or power or interest or whatever, technology, then there's always the need to come back to those things. So it's, 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 um, um, I mean, I'm really curious to see the new National Museum because I think that, from what I've seen, the tension between what are going to be the objects and the overwhelming video context of that, which um, uh, I think it'll be an interesting question to ask oneself after going through what matters of the experience here and what is the experience here and is it the artifact, is it the space, is it the architecture, is it the me that's going through that space? I mean, it's all of those, but I think museums are always reinterpreting, so it's not a very good, clear answer to anything, but um, just amusing. <laughs> I guess, I mean, particularly from a, a user's point of view, if we look at that maybe <coughs> 17th century function of the museum as a form of archive, it seems that that's much more clear when you go through websites of museums and look through historic shows, which then becomes a kind of archive of concerns over time, taste over time, um, and ideas as they're generated, discarded, regenerated over time. I wonder how important that is to someone like Mataf. I mean, because I experience it both physically and a lot virtually. So do you pay a lot of attention to the website as much to the space? Yeah. Uh, very much. So <clears throat> you have... <clears throat> To react a little bit first to what uh, Adam says. So, uh, if you find yourself in the permanent collection in Metaf, uh, in front of an NG Flatoon work in upstairs, it needs some context as well. You have a portrait of a, of a woman, and you, it's, it's space is strange, you need to understand that. You need to put some context in it. So, you need interpretation. You need uh, to say the artist had a, was a politically engaged, was a feminist, was. Uh, <clears throat> working in certain um, context with social struggle. Uh, she suffered, she was in jail. Um, uh, she was a, a citizen that was really involved in society, in politics, but also in uh, herself, in making a new art, a new language of art. So you need to give this kind of context, but at the same time you need to put it in a way that is a, a nice experience. Uh, now for the <clears throat> digital. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> 
at Metaf, we uh, have this project, it's called the Encyclopedia of, uh, the Encyclopedia of Modern, uh, of the um, Arab world and modernity. Uh, and uh, it's more scholars peer reviewed. So you, you have, a <coughs> you publish only uh, scholars, essays and um, uh, biographies the digital use used systematically to share knowledge beyond the walls of the museum, Arabic, English. So one thing is you have so much knowledge uh, or texts produced about the artists from this uh, geography of the world that mostly were in English. So we invest a lot in making it accessible in Arabic. And now in the space itself as a physical space, we want to make it accessible to everyone, uh, to uh, uh, more languages. Uh, but the, the other aspect of the digital that can be also an experience, it can be more poetic in the, the Rux uh, Media Collective exhibition. If you find yourself in the city, you, you relate to the city, you have an experience and you see um, <clears throat> lights, uh, uh, work, it's uh, somehow, you don't necessarily know the artist, you don't know the museum, you don't know how, who did this uh, gesture. But still, it is an exp a museum experience, a museum uh, 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 that is beyond the walls experience. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to put it in a clearer way. So the, 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 the digital, when you put something in a website, we have the encyclopedia website, we also the online collection uh, project that is not very, um, still not active. But you put things there for experience and you don't need to interpretation to put it in context. It's more about experience and you contribute somehow to, to the change and to build in information and uh, this idea of progress and a museum becomes an anonymous contributor to build in culture. Somehow. I guess, I mean, fascinating. I mean, my experience a lot is that a lot of the discourse around the show increasingly happens on social media mm -hmm. and involves people who saw the show, people who didn't see the show, people who only saw an Instagram of the show and it has this kind of other life beyond it. Is that something you find in Moscow? I think it's really important for, uh, for our museum. I mean, Instagram presence, uh, Facebook, all the chats, I mean, everywhere we try to share the information. But also uh, there is several uh, very important online blogs which criticize everything that we do, for example. And now, especially Telegram, which is uh, it's totally anonymous. You, un you don't know. Uh, who is doing it, uh, who is writing it, so, and they're, you know, repeated blogs, criticism of our exhibitions, or why we're spending money on doing what we do, and so it's a gr great way of dialogue, I mean, and always correcting yourself. I mean, also, there's VR uh, experiences that, you know, uh, many museums are turning to. I mean, I think it's important to balance with the useful information, like website and information that you put out there, or getting into very much into digital aspect. And we try to you know, balance not going all the way, you know, diving into it, but not to much replace the, the experience of the museum. And we want people to come to museum by getting the information from the website and Instagram and everything, not just try to completely re replace it. So we haven't gone into the virtual reality yet of it. So try to find the dialogue. Michael, could you ever imagine spending as much on your digital presence as your physical presence in terms we of buildings? Have, we already have a much, much larger aud audience online, as I'm sure the Whitney and many museums do, than, than actual. And you could say that 18th century idea of a museum as an archive is well served by that, which is partly why the museum, if the archive, the information can be organized online, then the museum itself, to justify its existence, has to be a very powerful experience. It has to be something you cannot get online. And in a way, that has pushed our museums. The online you can, has really pushed us to do something different than simply catalog and record artworks and write essays and do things like that, which maybe is better in that medium. Um, and it's also, uh, so I think it's pushed us to do other things. And of course, the medium itself, all those media, websites, Instagram, have become galleries themselves. So we handed over our Instagram feed to an artist for three months. It was crazy. It was wonderful. It was eccentric. Uh, every, it wasn't information. It was, well, it was, but it was of a completely different nature. It wasn't promotional. Um, and so that was exciting, too. So I think, and I mean, I've been commissioning digital artwork since 1995, where artists are sort of thinking about how to use the digital space as a medium 
Um, and, I, and I guess this is the case that I, I don't imagine it replaces, um, as long as we're in physical bodies, probably we still need physical places. But it, like most media in art, from stone to cinema and photography, it's additive. And we have yet more languages to express it does that. Seem that the more that there is the digital, people, it makes people even want to be together more in a funny yeah. sort of way. I mean, it doesn't replace. It doesn't. It's, it's the uh, opposite. Quite, absolutely. It creates commonality. Yeah. But I guess at some point in time, if you carry on acquiring and collecting, you're going to run out of space. Online? No, physically. <laughs> physically, where oh, you might physically? be physically? <laughs> Not if we're building museums in China. <laughs> There's a lot of people who need our, you know, like, the, actually, I don't, I'm not so sure. I used to think we were going to come to that limit. But I have, I have started to think very differently about that. Instead of slowing down, um, the wonderful thing about owning something is you have the control over it. One way to, to exercise your control is to protect it, right? Conserve it, don't let anybody see it. The other way to exercise your control is to send it into the world, right? To exercise your control because you can do things that a private collector who is worried about its value and a scratch on it or whatever, ours is a much larger. So this idea that museums are in the I'll city. remember that next time. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> we'll trade back and forth. <laughs> I still still have those conservators, but this is theory. <laughs> So we're now putting the artworks in schools. So we have an art gallery in an elementary school on MacArthur Park. We have, we're building a museum in the south part of Los Angeles in a very underserved community that doesn't have cultural structures. We're talking about sharing our collections from East LA to Shanghai. You know, it's, it's I'm not sure. I actually think that if we have a larger vision of the notion of what, who, who that archive serves, and where it can go, um, then that idea of continuing to collect is exciting because there are a lot of people in this world we inhabit. And um, I actually think of museums as a good thing. They're gathering spaces, they're educational spaces, they create common understanding, exchange, deliberation, if not discussion. Uh, they invite artists, and, and eventually also they often produce work, like we're in the business of commissioning work themselves. So I guess I'm a booster for this idea that we should be putting museums in elementary schools and in places that don't, and we should be sharing all those resources. I, mean, I guess one question I'd have about that is in what sense a LACMA museum, let's say, in Shanghai or Shenzhen, is still LACMA. Will the it's language not, be English? Would it all be in Chinese? Well, it's not actually. We're so we're actually, we're planning a partnership in China right now in Shanghai. But one of the key things is it's not LACMA. It's not branding a place with LACMA. It's a partnership with an existing organization, use museum with an existing Chinese contemporary art collection. So we're really become partners for exchange, using our educational programs for even training and exchange. Um, and so, yeah, actually the question is, we lose our identity a little bit. That's part of the point, is not to brand and force, but actually I'm in to deconstruct our identity in the face of you know, the new realities. And so I don't see it as a projection of, of, a, of our collections or ideas out, but rather a complication, um, but, a, but a chance to share, like a bigger platform to share and to, um, to reach people. And the, will that also change the mothership? In yes, I hope so. Well, actually, I think not only will China change the mothership, but our museum in South LA is going to change the mothership entirely, because by being involved in another community with a completely different point of view, I think that's going to change too. And I'm looking, I mean, literally I'm looking for devices like that to literally to change the mothership because I think there is a little bit of exhaustion in the simplicity and the, the formula that's out there. And we use, so the ways to do that are, are people and audiences that are diverse, places that are diverse, and of course artists. We use artists to hammer away at the edges, whether it's to let an artist design your logo or, or you know, define the front of the museum as we have, is that artists are really good at, at um, interrupting regular business and coming up with a new point of view. So I guess it's a, it's a process of deconstruction and reconstruction ongoing. Monica, do you feel you're used in this way sometimes? <laughs> 
<laughs> Was that a negative being used? Michael, or? Let's, let's <laughs> talk, shall we? Like, yeah, we're talking. We'll talk after. <laughs> Um, this is actually, I was thinking exactly this when, when Michael was saying, but I think, um, but the, I, I kind of began in a way, a different way by saying each time I work in, with the museum, uh, how the artist also approaches that and how they see their own practice in relationship to the institution also matters. So I just as there's no singular, I mean, the institution is a singular and yet it's not, the artist is a singular and yet they're not. And I think the artist, the, the artistic practice has to also think, in, in, in the case of Mata, for example, we, we, I was saying that it's one of the more sensuous exhibitions we've done. We've had a kind of a, a, an engagement with uh, the curatorial team, because partly because of older friendships. Uh, Abdullah came to Delhi many years ago, so you also feel, you know, like you can trust someone in a different way just because you know them that long. Um, but also because of the intellectual and other kinds of hospitality, right? Like, so I do believe that this question of who's using whom is, if, is one question. But another question is really how does one look at a relationship between practice and institution? And are institutions amenable to the idea of practice or the idea of product? And I think this is the distinction I would make. Are they just looking at a work to put on the wall, or are they looking for an approach that will make a crack in the wall? Hopefully the latter. Hopefully the latter. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a value judgment. <laughs> I think at this point it's probably um, a good time to broaden things out to our audience. So does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? If you put your hand up, there will probably be a microphone, my microphone, coming around. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Abdul Ghani Boudra, Wakalat al Anba al Qatariya. Kadalik, or like any shaman. La Shukran al Rajib. Doctor Karam Yetza will tell Tarjama mechanic. For Hakika, the Ach in New York, and the Matakalam and the Amal Fania. وقال عندما يأتي فنان ويعرض أوراق بيضاء يعني لا عليها أي شيء فإن المتلقي يبقى في حيرة من أمره من هنا نتساءل يعني باعتباركم مسؤولي متاحف ما هو تقييمكم للعمل الفني مثلا أي واحد شخص لأن نظرة الآخر ونظرة غير الفنان وغير المثقف للفن بأنه عبث وليس له رسالة على أي أساس يتم تقييم عمل فني بأنه ذو قيمة ويستحق العرض وأن هذا العمل لا يستحق العرض وهو عبث شكرا لكم Please summarize the translation and tell me if it's correct or not so referring to Robert Ryman the white paintings and our colleague journalist asking uh, on which scale, what, what is the tool of measure of uh, the value of the work if uh, there's nothing to see in the work? Um, well, the, uh, I mean, I think I just, I only use that example because it's a question of the point of view of seeing. Um, anything, you can look at something and see nothing, and this is true about many things, or you can look at something and see a lot, depending on in what context you see it. So I think all I wanted to say is when you see one painting like that, because it is a reductive approach, a very minimalist, abstract approach, um, you see maybe nothing. But if you see 20 or 30 paintings, you realize that it is about the diversity of the world, of color, of structure. Robert Ryman once said, I mean, he said often that he was really the only realist painter, because <laughs> everybody else was making, you know, images of things, but he was making the thing itself. And, but it's always a question of it, you can see nothing or you can see something. I just came from the mosque um, here, and you can see nothing because you can see a series of stained glass windows that look all the same or you can notice that a few of them are slightly different because there's an int intentional and subtle 
mistake, um, you know, which is a statement about imperfection is part of our world. So some people look at that and they read nothing, and some people look at that subtle thing and they read uh, uh, volumes about life and philosophy. Um, and so again, all the value is a question of the context. And as a museum, we don't worry that much about you know, the, what something costs or not. I, I, it's not our issue other than having to pay insurance. <laughs> and one of the things we know as a museum of art of long periods of times is those values keep changing so much that we try to ignore them because in one epoch something is monetarily valuable and then in another, another it's not and the reverse is true. So we try to focus on the other aspects of, of the work. But I think that idea of seeing nothing or seeing something, that's just an extreme example of that, but it's true about so many things, like looking at a flower or whatever you look at, depending on what context it's, it's in. Then it's one of the fronts. First and foremost, thank you to each of you. It was exquisite panel. As we sit here today on the cusp of this historic opening tomorrow, and we're talking about an East and West um, trends, what would be your aspirations for the National Museum of Qatar to continue a crust dialogue, not only in this region, but around the world from the perches that you sit and the wisdom that you bring? Thank you. To me? No, I think you, 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 I, we, 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 we will discover tomorrow the National Museum of Qatar. But uh, I can tell that uh, in Doha, also to answer the slowing down the museums, I think Qatar is just warming up for the museums. And um, uh, if you look around the, the city, there is no art school in terms of like a, a, a conventional art school, like where you go to an art practice. But there are a number of universities for design school, art history, museum practices, uh, galleries, a number of things that contribute to the the educational uh, um, uh, cultural landscape or artistic landscape might have itself. We give a uh, number of art lessons, drawings, uh, artist on contours, both practical and intellectual. Um, so the, the museum, the, each museum in, in Qatar, we have few museums open, the Islamic Art Museum, uh, Matav, uh, private museums, Sheikh Faisal Museum, uh, the fire station as an alive residency and museum, a number of museums that are still under uh, development and in construction uh, to respond to, uh, to needs, uh, the, the, the growing communities, the diversity of um, uh, cultures in, in, in Doha is uh, every, day, every day evolving, needs these cultural places, that these places for uh, and counters. So I'm, uh, when I, I say it's warm, you know, it's, it's, it's not an image to say, okay, we're going to expand. Um, but Doha, for example, is um, developing museum in a way to respond to the needs in society. We don't, we don't, we don't bring, uh, bring a Guggenheim or a Louvre, but we want to work with all major international colleagues to build uh, institutions that produce expressions or help actually produce because expressions with artists and poets. So we help them to formulate, to edit, to bring them to audiences and work on translation, education, and use the, the, this tool. So what we see tomorrow is also a statement. It's a, a, from the architecture to the program, it's all made with uh, people who create and people who live and experience and look, experiment, and go together in a journey to the, to, to, to the future to, uh, and evolve in society. I mean, I think I'd also like to add that I think one of the interesting things being here for me is it does relativize, relativize ideas of East and West. So you've come West. I've come yeah. Other of us have come East. And I think that also it's sort of interesting, I think, certainly in Asia, that kind of West doesn't just mean America and Europe. It can mean other places in Asia, which is a very, very big place. And I think for me, that's been one of the fascinating things about seeing the art here and the dialogues here and the conversations here is it, it kind of unlocks your typical idea of what constitutes an East 
what constitutes a West. I, mean, I just find it fascinating that here we are in a country that the idea of a museum is being invented all within two decades, mm -hmm. and that all of the museums are essentially new. And this is the only one I've seen here so far, so I can speak without any knowledge whatsoever. But, but the idea of starting with a tabula rasa like that is a really interesting one because we, I mean, you know, we in the United States, I mean, have a reasonably long history of museums, and I and a place like the Whitney, we're always defining ourselves in relationship to all of the other museums and institutions, not only in the United States, but internationally, but to be in a place where it's really an open playing field like that is a really wonderful possibility. So um, I, wish, I wish I had the opportunity to play. <laughs> Are there any more questions? There's one more here. Here comes the curveball. <laughs> With the rise of private museums, private foundations, not just in the United States, globally, Asia, Europe, what impact are their kinds of public programs, exhibitions, artist commissionings, having on more traditional museums of modern and contemporary art? Um, <laughs> well, well, no, I was going to point the finger at Michael. Oh, yeah. uh, I was well, going to point that Vasily could be interesting, too, Moscow, I mean, in relationship well, to yeah, Moscow. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll, I'll be happy in to jump in, too. Well, in Moscow, we obviously have uh, big museums like Hermitage and Tretyakov and Pushkin, which have long, long history. Our museum is fairly new. It's 20 years old, but we are living in wonderful time, which in the last uh, basically 10 years, we had three new private museums opened, and one big one is about to open. And it creates a great, great diversity. I mean, Garage, uh, with its educational programs, exhibitions programs, uh, it's a wonderful institution that actually now created regional biennial, triennial, which also tries to promote uh, artists from regions. And it gives uh, uh, private institutions don't, well, first of all, they have uh, no constraints as public institutions with budgets. And ideology, I mean, obviously every museum tries to open up doors and, and do what you know is uh, globally possible, but also private institutions are kind of, uh, it's a great thing to have both, because they kind of challenge traditional museums always to be open, and it's, it's, a, it's a way of uh, working together and dialoguing and creating a great dialogue. I mean, in Moscow we all try to work all together to really promote contemporary art and uh, but one benefit of traditional museums, as I see it, uh, there's no, you cannot sell works. I mean, Russia, one thing is stable if you are a city museum or, or a federal museum, if the work becomes part of your collection, it's there forever. It's governed by the <coughs> laws and it will never leave. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen uh, times when private museums uh, are forced to sell works or, you know, works happen to leave the collection. So. That's also about preserving the, the past. I think it's important. Both institutions play a role in developing the country's uh, future. Um, well, I think, you know, it's interesting that the, um, it's two sides because w one is that a lot of what a museum is when you're a big scale public museum is you're a collective. Right? Like we don't even have an acquisition budget. So everything that's in our museum is a gift. So it's a collective. It's this, this container for everybody's hopes and dreams and their objects. And so, you know, sometimes it's frustrating because so much of the resources in art sometimes now are going to private museums. And so you feel like, oh, so much more could be accomplished. And there's something about the public museum that's owned by the public, that's governed by a lot of voices. So there's an accountability, and so we value that accountability of the public museum, even the rules and regulations that make it accountable. On the other hand, um, you're right, Vasily, that I think that the private museums have pushed public museums because, and, and I'd say the devilish, one of the nice qualities, it's, 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 some of it's taken us from a sort of arrogance to an underdog status which I think is kind of good sometimes because you can, um, it, it means with less resources you have to do more 
and that makes you inventive. And so it's kind of flipped because you're, you know, you thought you were a big museum, but now you're in this position of being more scrappy and, and uh, inventive to survive against, uh, you know, museums with bigger budgets in that area. So I think there's two sides. The main thing, though, is that almost every private museum the question is how long it stays private, because we have seen in our, in many nations, um, the idea of a private museum that is converted at some point into the same system of even accountability, government involvement, independent boards of trustees. As we know, a lot of the founders of those museums would be rolling over in their graves if they understood how they were being <laughs> transformed. And I say the same is true about foundations in the US. So there's that question of time. Um, and I think it's hard not to argue that, I mean, more is more in this case. I still think that's one of the, the, the it's the easiest way to think about it. But also, there's such a diversity of private museums. I mean, there are lots and lots of private museums being set up in the United States that to a large degree are even sort of tax shelters, basically, where, you know, they're open minimal amount of hours yeah. and they, they don't really fully provide the kind of public service. But, there's such diversity in private museums, and I, I would agree with Michael. It really is how many of it are really in it for the long term, either as they are or as they will need to be established, because um, so many of them will disappear. And you know, you look at the museums again in New York, whether it's the Morgan Library or the Whitney or the Guggenheim. I mean, and all of these started as private collections yeah. in one way or another. And, um, but how many of them will graduate, so to speak, into becoming truly public institutions? And how many of them really desire to participate in that role now? I mean, some do more than others, obviously. So, um, you know, obviously coming from a, the public side of things, I hope that those private institutions really believe that they have a higher mission to serve and a, a larger public purpose. Um, and I think some do, and I think some don't. Yeah, no, that's a good point, because there are some who have that sense of purpose, and we're giving them the benefit of the doubt. There are others who have been started who shall not be named, but where museums are set up to add value to private collections, which will then be dispersed and all of that. So I think we're taking the, giving the benefit of the doubt to the sense of purpose, that's which right. is in this, the other. like pushing the whole thing in the same direction. That's right. I think um, this is where we've reached the end of our time here. Um, but I thought maybe we leave the final word to the person who's foolishly discarded her microphone, um, but also who has the exhibition here. Um, which do you prefer, the work in the museum or the work outside the museum? Not this museum specifically. <laughs> you mean the work at my, in, my, in my studio still? <laughs> no, I'm joking. But this is, um, I mean, the, you know, the funny thing is we've been talking about um, how this digital world is, seems to be everywhere. The fact is that digital, digitality has a very hard materiality, right? There's servers that are running on our, so the cloud is not uh, immaterial, just like an artwork is as immaterial as it is material. The, you know, we, we've given it many words from the aura to the, you know, whatever. So this thing between uh, whether a work is within or without, I think I'm going to go, I'm going to say that, um, actually, you said it earlier, you don't know when a work of art, wow. Um, you don't actually um, know where your work of art is contained, either in place or in time, because um, people take it with them, and they, it, it can, comes back at different points of time. So. Um, I'm just going to say that I can make no choices. <laughs> Wherever it goes. Wherever it goes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming this morning. Thank you, panelists.